My name is uh, Greg Manette, and I'm the director and moderator of Religion Soup. And I, I work in chaplaincy with the navigators here at St. Mary's University. And I'm also a proud graduate of this fine institution. I graduated in 2007. And I want to welcome you to the second annual Religion Soup Dialogues. It is great to see so many of you here to take in this evening's event. And we had such a good time doing it last year that we wanted to make sure that there was no fear of a snowstorm. Last year, the second end of Acadia, half the people were able to show up because it was the worst snowstorm of the year. It took us three hours to drive with Bartram and to Wolfville, which normally only takes about an hour. But I want to thank each of you for coming out to this event. And I trust that you will find it very informative and educational. That is the goal of religion soon. Regardless of where you stand regarding your views on Jesus of Nazareth, we hope that these events will give you much to consider and mull over in the coming days, months, and years. It is our hope that religion soup will create in you a desire to learn, and if you are not yet on a journey to explore the history behind the founder of Christianity, namely Jesus, that you will begin to study up on the life of arguably the most influential human being who has ever lived. We want to thank our many sponsors and supporters who have who have helped make this night happen. It takes a lot of time and energy as well as financial support to make an event like this move from an idea to a reality. For this reason, we give thanks to the main organizer of the event, the Navigators of Canada, to which I work with. And then as uh, the, uh, President Dodds has said, the Navigators are an international Christian organization that strives to help people learn about Jesus through both word and deed. We, the Halifax Navigators, are involved in local ministry on campus here at St. Mary's, as well as internationally in our work with Uganda Venture. Uganda Venture gives Halifax University students the experience of serving the poor in rural Uganda, which is just a small taste of what we do, and you can find out more about the Navigators inside your program for this evening. We'd also like to thank St. Mary's University for generously supporting this event uh, financially, as well as Acadia Divinity College that is one of the key sponsors of this event. Acadia Div is a leading seminary in Eastern Canada and is one of the most academically recognized faculty in the country. And you will find an information table for Acadia Divinity College in the foyer on your way out. We'd also like to thank Shiloh University Church, the Archdiocese of Halifax and Yarmouth, uh, the Catholic Christian Outreach, Fall River Chapel, and Excel Business Systems for their sponsorship of this event. We'd also like to say that if you feel inclined to make a donation to help cover the cost of this evening's dialogue, that'd be much appreciated. Although this event is free, we hope you will enjoy it so much that you wouldn't mind contributing a donation to one of the two donation bins located near the doors on the way out. Your support will pay for the filming of this evening dialogue so that thousands of people can view it on YouTube and benefit from it as well. So we thank you in advance for whatever you were able to give. Unlike last January, which was a debate, this evening is a dialogue. You will find the order for tonight's event outlined in your programs. We're going to start the uh, with opening presentations by both Dr. Lacona and Professor Martin, and then we're going to move into a 25-minute dialogue when both presenters will engage with each other's thoughts on the topic. I want you to imagine that you get to be a fly in the wall when these two scholars are sitting in a local pub bantering back and forth about their views on the evening's topic. That's what we're trying to create tonight with bottles of water and a few hundred flies on that wall. <laughs> After this, we will have questions from the audience, from you. That's where you come in. Like last January, you were asked to text message your questions to the phone numbers found in the program or up on the screen. As Stephen Peterson, the reviewer of last year's event, wrote in the Chronicle Herald, the Q&A format works like gangbusters. So please do text in your questions, make them interesting, relevant, don't sermonize or give the lecture, uh, make them challenging. What we're going to do is we're going to screen them, make sure there's no duplicates, and find some of the most interesting questions that you you put forward for our guests tonight. We would kindly ask you to not make any audio or video recordings of this event. This event is being 
professionally filmed will be on YouTube for viewing within the next few weeks. Also, if you have a cellular phone, if you could please turn that off. Uh, sometimes it's not always the young person whose cell phone goes off. Sometimes it's the older person that forgets they even have a cell phone in the pocket. So check the cell phone in your pocket and uh, put on vibrate. Religion Soup is an annual dialogue event aimed at fostering discussion around topics relevant to the Christian faith. Tonight we bring together two of the leading scholars in the field of Christian origins in order to discuss one of the biggest questions relating to Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus. It is helpful to hear different perspectives in order to be both informed and to expand one's own horizon. Christianity is an historic faith rooted in ancient Judaism and finds its origins in the community of first century devotees to Jesus of Nazareth. One of last year's presenters, Professor Craig Evans, accurately stated that Jesus has left a very big wake in history. This is true. Without Jesus, Christianity would not exist. We would not be here this evening having this dialogue. Last year's other participant, Professor Bart Herman, recently stated in his latest book, Did Jesus Exist?, that, quote, there are several points on which virtually all scholars of antiquity agree. Jesus was a Jewish man, known to be a preacher and teacher, who was crucified in Jerusalem during the reign of the Roman Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea. This is the view of nearly every trained scholar. One must ask the question, how did Christianity get started in the first place? How did a crucified Jewish man in the first half of the first century manage to spawn the largest religion in the world today? The first Christians, we are told, believed that Jesus was raised from the dead by God. Whether or not this happened is the topic for tonight's dialogue. We are very proud to welcome Dr. Michael Icona and Professor Dale Martin to Halifax for this evening's Religion Soup Dialogue. Tonight, they will be discussing the resurrection of Jesus and why it matters. I will give a brief introduction prior to each of the opening presentations. Both of our guests will present for approximately 25 to 30 minutes, beginning with Dr. Michael Lacona. Mike Lacona is Associate Professor in Theology at Houston Baptist University, and he's the President of Risen Jesus Incorporated. Mike was interviewed by Lee Strobel in his book, The Case for the Real Jesus, and appeared in Strobel's video, The Case for Christ. He's the author of numerous books, including The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach, which you can purchase at the book table on the way out. He also has authored Paul Meets Muhammad. He's also co-authored with Gary Habermas of the award-winning book, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. And he's co-editor with William Dembski of Evidence for God, 50 Arguments for Faith from the Bible, History, Philosophy, and Science. Mike is a member of the Evangelical Philosophical Society, the Institute for Biblical Research, and the Society of Biblical Literature. He has spoken on more than 50 university campuses and has appeared on dozens of radio and television programs. His website is risenjesus.com. Mike earned his PhD with the highest distinction from the University of Pretoria in South Africa. We're very, very pleased to have him with us this evening. And uh, Dr. Lacona, let me ask you this question. Did Jesus rise physically from the dead? Would you give Dr. Lacona a well-known social welcome? Nova Scotia and Halifax. This is my very first time. It's been a long time since I've been to Canada. Um, but this is just beautiful up here. And uh, so I, I don't know that I want to go back. <laughs> but maybe I'll have to wait till February before I make that kind of choice, right? Instead of October. Well, I want to thank St. Mary's University for hosting this evening's dialogue. And uh, just look forward to it. Um, this is going to be fun. About 2,000 years ago, Jesus claimed, uh, made some radical claims. Um, he claimed to be God's agent, chosen to usher in his kingdom, um, and a, a bunch of other claims he made as well. So radical that his critics would come up and say, uh, 
you are who you say you are, if you can do what you say you can do, show us a sign. Something. Give us some proof. And Jesus said, I'll give you one sign. My resurrection. So the bottom line is this. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, that makes him a false prophet whom no one, no rational person at least, should follow. On the other hand, if Jesus rose from the dead, then he did so in confirmation of his personal radical claims. And that gives us something we're going to have to think very seriously about. And the question is, is there any good evidence to show that Jesus, in fact, rose from the dead? I think that there is. Um, and I've devoted a lot of study to this. The reason I, I did was because, uh, by my nature, you know, we all have our idiosyncrasies, and one of mine is that I'm a second guesser. I, I second guess and doubt just about anything. Um, I want to tell you a story. It's truly embarrassing to me, but just to give you an example of it, um, a, a few years back, I ran out of cologne and I wanted to, to get something else, and so I was thinking, well, what should I get? And I went to this department store and I was looking at all these different fragrances, and I got down to about two that I really liked, and so I'm going back and forth, back and forth, wondering which one I, you know, would enjoy over the long term. And so I chose it, went up and purchased it. Leave the store, about 15 minute drive home, I get about two minutes from my house, but the whole time I'm thinking, I should have got that other one. Well, maybe not. No, I'm glad I got it. No, I should have got that other one. Two minutes away, I kid you not, I turned the car around, went back to the department store, swapped them, came back thinking, all right, I think I got the right one. I wore it a couple times and never wore it again. I mean, this is just frustrating, this kind of stuff. Um, but that's just the way I'm wired. And if I'm going to fret over something as silly as a bottle of cologne, um, of course, I'm going to fret over other things that are of much greater importance. So, if, if I make a mistake on a bottle of cologne, I've only wasted 40 bucks. But if I make a mistake, I was thinking on my worldview, it has the potential to cost me eternity. And so I got thinking, you know, gosh, the, the, the history of the world and Plato, Aristotle, and all these people up through today, we disagree on so many different things when it comes to worldview. How on earth could I ever figure this out? Maybe I can't. Um, but I wanted to see if there was any good evidence for the truth of Christianity. Is it rational to believe it, to be a Christian, to follow Jesus? And since Jesus gave his resurrection as the sign by which we could know Christianity was true, I figured, well, that's a great place to start. And in fact, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, if Christ has not been raised, our faith is worthless. And so it seemed like this would be a good thing to investigate. I got involved in a PhD program, started my investigation. I decided that I would approach this a little bit differently. I would approach it from the viewpoint of a historian. So I wanted to study how professional historians outside the community of biblical scholars go about their business. Um, because very few biblical scholars are actually trained in these areas. Um, and so I wanted to see how they did it. And so I started reading you know, hundreds of books and journal articles on, on how to, to, to do history, how to do historical investigation. And uh, it all resulted in a book a little over 700 pages. And uh, I, I just really was consumed with this. And in the end, I, I was convinced that what I had originally believed had been revealed by God's Spirit, had been confirmed by history. And namely, that God existed and that He actually revealed Himself to mankind in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know that we can show that God raised Jesus from the dead, but I do think that we can show that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so this evening, I want to talk a little about that. And I'm going to make it simple. In fact, I'm going to make this so simple that even a Southern Baptist could understand. <laughs> I'm going to construct a positive historical case. You can strike that from the transcript, please. <laughs> I'm going to construct a positive historical case for Jesus' resurrection using two major building blocks, facts and method. Let's begin with the facts, and I'm going to give five. Now, in doing these five facts, I want to start off with a timeline. I'm going to borrow this timeline from a friend and mentor of mine named Gary Habermas. Um, and he talks about, uh, you know, most scholars, the majority who study the subject, would say that Jesus was crucified in either April of 30 or April of 33. It seems that there's a slight majority who opt for April of 30. Um, it really doesn't matter, and since 30 is a round number, let's start with that. So we'll say Jesus was crucified in April of 30. 
Now, a few years after that, there's a skeptic, a persecutor of the church named Paul. And Paul had an experience that he would, at least was convinced was the risen Jesus appearing to him. Virtually all scholars agree on this as well. Um, they're not saying that Jesus appeared to Paul, but they're saying that he had an experience that he was persuaded was the risen Jesus appearing to him. And that experience radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. Now, scholars don't know exactly when this happened, but the guess is somewhere between maybe one and three years. It could be a little bit more, whatever. But let's just say two years to, to work with. It doesn't really matter for what we're presenting here this evening. In fact, the later the better, the later the crucifixion, for me, the better, but we're just going to take 30 for the crucifixion, and let's say Paul, two years later, that places it 32 when he has this experience that he thinks is the risen Jesus appearing to him. Now, in our New Testaments, there are 13 letters attributed to Paul. Of these, it's undisputed that seven of them Paul actually wrote, and then the other six are disputed to varying degrees. So just to make things simple this evening, I'm only going to appeal to those letters for which we are certain Paul wrote. One of those letters is the uh, letter that Paul wrote to the church at Galatia. And in Galatians chapter 1, Paul sa uh, says that three years after his conversion, 35, Paul goes up to Jerusalem and he meets with Peter, the lead apostle there. And he also sees James, the brother of Jesus. And he, he met with him, he remained with him for 15 days, he said. Now it's interesting to note that the Greek term that Paul uses here for meet or visit is hysteresi, from which we get the English word history. You see, Paul had not known Jesus during and walked with him during his ministry, so he wanted to get the whole nine yards from one of those who had, and who better than Peter, the lead apostle. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul says that 14 years later he goes back up to Jerusalem. Now the text, whether you read it in Greek or English, it's ambiguous here, it's vague. We don't know if it's talking about 14 years after this visit or 14 years after his conversion. So we'll say 11 to 14 years after this visit, that places us somewhere between uh, 46 and 49. And at that point, Paul says the objective of his visit was because he wanted to run the gospel message. I want you to remember this, the gospel message. He wanted to run the gospel message past them that he had been preaching all these years to ensure he hadn't been working in vain all these years. In other words, he wanted to make sure he was preaching what the Jerusalem apostles were preaching. And he says, they added nothing to what I had to say. Instead, instead they granted to me the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they said, you're good, Paul. Keep up the good work, brother. So according to Paul, within 16 to 19 years, or 46 to 49 AD, Paul says he's preaching the same thing as the Jerusalem apostles when it comes to the gospel message, the essentials of Christian faith. Now, for all we know, Paul could have been lying there. He could have been exaggerating. So historians look for corroborating data, and fortunately in this case we have some. There were some people who history reports probably knew and were trained by the apostles. For example, there was a guy named Clement of Rome, and he probably had a, a, a friendship with Peter. And then another guy named Polycarp who had a friendship was mentored by John. Now remember some of these names, and you know, in case you have children someday and you're trying to think of names for guys, think of, you know, some of these, Polycarp. So, you've got Clement, who knows Peter, probably, Polycarp, who probably knows John, and we have a, a letter from each of, of, of these two guys who have survived. And they're writing after the death of Paul. So it'd be interesting, if Paul had been teaching heresy on the essentials, we would expect these guys perhaps to chide and correct Paul on it. Instead, what we find from them is saying very laudatory things about Paul. Clement calls him the blessed Paul, places him on par with his mentor Peter. Polycarp says that Paul, and I quote, accurately, yeah, Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. That's pretty neat. So that seems to suggest that even after Paul's death, he hadn't changed. He had, that what he said here was correct. He was preaching what the Jerusalem apostles were preaching, and then after his death, they said, yep, he continued to preach what the, you know, the message of truth, accurately and reliably. I could give some more evidence, but that should suffice to show that at least when we're hearing Paul and the gospel message, the essentials, we are hearing the voice of the Jerusalem apostles. 46 to 49. 
A few years after that, Paul goes up to an ancient Mediterranean city named Corinth, and he starts a church there, the First Baptist Church of Corinth. <laughs> and after he spends a little time there, he leaves and he goes up on to some other uh, work in the ministry, and the church at Corinth send him some letters in their dialogue and corresponding with him. They're asking theological questions, questions about practicing Christianity within the church and what to do in this situation and so forth, and Paul answers them. They go back and forth. There were three or four of these letters that Paul wrote back to them. We have two of them. One of those letters is 1 Corinthians. We're going to look, he writes it about 55, or within 25 years of the crucifixion. Now, we're going to look at chapter 15 in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to give you an idea of where the Gospels fit in here. I'm not really going to be appealing, appealing to them this evening. Um, but what we're going to do, I want to just give you an idea of when they were written. We don't know exactly when they were written. Scholars aren't in agreement with this. You have someone like James Crossley, kind of a skeptical guy, an agnostic at Sheffield. He puts Mark in the 40s. Uh, most scholars put Mark between 65 and 70. Some conservative scholars would put Matthew in the maybe the 50s and so forth. Other evangelicals may put Matthew in the 80s or the 70s. So I'm not, I don't want to get into the different arguments, but the standard dating is Mark was written 65 to 70, or another 10 to 15 years later. And then Matthew comes, or Luke, we don't know which one, one of them comes a little later, you know, maybe Matthew around 80, Luke 85, and then John last writes probably between 90 and 95. So within 35 to 65 years of Jesus' death. Pretty early, actually, by its ancient standards for a biography. But the point I really want to make here is 1 Corinthians comes before any of them. At least a decade, if not more, before any of the Gospels are written. When you look at chapter 15, Paul opens up by saying, I want to remind you of the gospel message I had preached to you. Remember that? The gospel message he ran by the Jerusalem apostles in between 46 and 49. Here it is in 55. He says, I want to remind you of the gospel message I preached to you by which you became Christians and are continuing to walk in faith. And then he begins in verse 3 to tell what that gospel message is. And let me give you that. And our five facts, Paul was an eyewitness, or he claimed he believed he was an eyewitness of the risen Jesus. He's hostile at the time of his conversion. Number two, Paul knew Jesus' disciples. Three, he was teaching what they were teaching. All right, what were they teaching when it came to the resurrection? Here's the gospel message Paul talks about. I delivered to you at first what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 at one time. Paul adds, most of whom are still alive, but some have died. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and then Paul adds, last of all, as the one and timely born, he appeared also to me. So here we have Paul given three individual appearances to Peter and James, whom he met with twice, we've seen, and then Paul himself. This is eyewitness testimony. And then three group appearances to the twelve, to more than five hundred, to all the apostles. The reason the group appearances are important is because we know from modern psychology that group, appear, uh, group hallucinations are extremely rare, if not impossible. And so to have three of them would be very, very, very rare, if not impossible. The interesting part about this too, remember, he's saying this in 55, he said, I delivered to you when, in 51, when he wrote the letter, uh, or when he started the church there, what I had also received before then. So again, remember, we are looking at very, very early tradition here that goes back to the Jerusalem apostles themselves. So what we find in here is, number four, they were teaching, Jesus' disciples were teaching that he had risen from the dead and had appeared to them in individual and in group settings to friend and foe alike. And number five, they were teaching that Jesus was raised physically from the dead. His corpse had been raised from the dead. That's what I mean by that. Now, if I'm not using the Gospels, there's no empty tomb narratives. Paul doesn't mention an empty tomb, so how do we get this in Paul's letters? Well, it's really not that hard at all. And Paul's not reporting a narrative of the resurrection, but he does talk. He's going to get there indirectly. So, for example, there are at least five passages in Paul's undisputed letters in which he says things like, the way we will be raised from the dead is how Jesus was raised from the dead. Let me give you an example. This comes from 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. 
Paul says Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Now, first fruits was an agricultural term, meaning the first of the crops to be harvested. How many of you have grown some vegetables, a tomato plant, or something like that in your backyard? Great. A lot of them. Well, I'm from the deep south, and there are some of them throw them in the front yard, you know. <laughs> they do it while they're sitting on their couch on the front porch looking at it, you know what I mean? So you grow these tomato plants, and you watch it throughout the summer. They start off small, and then they get bigger, and they're green, and then they turn yellow, and then orange, and they get darker, and finally red, and you pull that first one that's ripe. You pull it off the plant, you slice it up, put it on a, on a sandwich, and eat it, it just tastes great, right? Well, that's the first fruits. You're ready for the others, but they're not ready yet. They're coming later. To be asleep was a euphemism in antiquity to mean that you're dead. It's like today we say he passed away rather than saying he croaked. So, what Paul's saying here is Christ has been raised from the dead, the, the, the first fruits who, of, the, of the dead. He's the first to be raised from the dead. Now, I know I'm not using the Gospels for this, but here, here's the thing. Maybe you're saying, well, yeah, but the Gospels talk about Jesus raising Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, and the widow's son. How can Jesus be the first fruits? Because they're raised in the same kind of body, only to die again. Jesus According to the context in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul saying Jesus is the first to be raised with a resurrection body. And he's going to go on to explain that a little bit. Well, if Jesus is the first fruits, when are the rest going to be raised? When are the apostles going to be raised? When are the uh, Christians who have died from that point on, and saints and every, the Old Testament and all, when are they going to be raised? When are our loved ones who have died as believers, when are they going to be raised? Paul answers that three verses later. He says, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, April 30. After that, those who belong to Christ at his coming, when Jesus returns. What happens to us in the meantime? Paul answered that in some of the other undisputed letters. He says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So you're going to be absent from the body. And then he says that he has the options. He can die and be with Christ or remain on in the body. In other words, when you're with Christ, you're out of the body. Your, your spirit goes to be with, with Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 17, illustrates this for us, kind of. He says, but we don't, Paul says, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who have died, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have died as believers. He's going to bring them with him, which means they're with him now. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remaining to the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Wait a minute, Paul. You said Jesus is bringing the dead back with them. How are they going to rise first? Very simple. Remember, Paul suggests here that when you die, your corpse is buried, your spirit leaves your body, goes to be with Jesus in heaven, and exists as a disembodied spirit. When Jesus returns, he brings our spirits back with him, puts them back in the corpses, resurrects the corpse, and transforms it into an immortal, glorious, powerful body that's, um, excuse me, that's animated by the Holy Spirit. So it's a, a physical resurrection of a corpse. That, that's then transformed into something immortal, glorious, powerful, and, and moved and enlivened by the Holy Spirit. It's a physical, bodily resurrection of a corpse. And if Christ is the first fruits of the dead, and we're going to be raised, our corpses are, that means Jesus, according to what the apostles were teaching, his corpse was raised from the dead. It's a bodily, physical resurrection. So that's our fifth fact. That leads us then to our second major building block. Method. What do we do with this information? Well, um, it, historians um, typically use four general criteria for what they call arguments of inference to the best explanation. This has nothing to do with how we get to the facts. It's once they take the facts, um, they, the, 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 the things that we have a, a good, secure evidence for to lead us to believe this is the way things were, these, these we'll call them facts. Uh, we can define facts differently, but let's just call them facts to just make it simple. Um, and then what they do is they formulate hypotheses in order to explain these facts. And then they compare the hypotheses to see which one best explains those facts. 
And the way you measure which hypothesis best explains those facts are using these kinds of criteria. And even though they sound kind of fancy, they're, they're pretty commonsensical. Explanatory scope is the ability of a hypothesis to account for all the facts. So let's say you've got uh, 10 facts that you want to consider. A hypothesis that can account for eight facts has greater explanatory scope than one that can only account for three. Imagine a jigsaw puzzle, and each piece of the puzzle is a fact. You know how you try to put the puzzle together and some of the pieces are orphaned? Um, so the puzzle solution that uses the most amount of pieces has played greater explanatory scope. Think about each puzzle piece being a fact. Explanatory power is the ability of a hypothesis to account for the facts without forcing them to fit or without excessive ambiguity. Think about this for a moment. Think about the, the jigsaw puzzle. You know how you can take pieces and you know how you can force them to fit, but you know they really don't go there? Well, you can do that as a historian too. It doesn't quite fit the hypothesis well, but you kind of make it fit that way. That's like an explanatory power. Or if you had too much ambiguity or vagueness, Michael Gulliver is an agnostic New Testament scholar, and he says, well, whatever the disciples experienced in terms of these appearances, uh, they, I'm not going to say they're hallucinations or delusions or illusions or whatever, but we kind of get the idea of what they are. They're natural phenomena. What? <laughs> well, people in the mental health profession would say, there's a massive difference between hallucinations, delusions, and illusions. And for you to just clump those all together is, is, is just naive. And so what Goulder is doing here is he's putting, he's, oh, we get the idea. Well, you're not really describing what happened. And so his hypothesis lacks explanatory power. Ad hoc, that's a Latin term that means for this. Imagine if we were to have a, a hypothesis that undetectable gremlins from Saturn were responsible for raising Jesus from the dead. They visited the earth in the first century. They didn't really care for Jesus, thought he was a lunatic, but they, they really didn't like what the Jews and or the Jewish and Roman leaders did to him. So in order to get back at them, they entered his body, reanimated it, spoke through it, and convinced others he'd been raised from the dead. Well, now that adequately explains all of the facts that we're talking about. It does so without forcing them. The problem is it's ad hoc. It was created, the hypothesis, for this. Complete improvisation without a shred of evidence for the stuff that would, like undetectable gremlins from Saturn. In other words, we wouldn't expect that hypothesis to be true other than it explains the facts. Very ad hoc. Every hypothesis has a degree of ad hocness to it, but the one that is least ad hoc is to be preferred. And then finally, plausibility it has to be in agreement with other widely accepted facts. Um, so let's, let's just take the resurrection hypothesis. Certainly, we have to say that it's implausible. It's, it's widely accepted that people don't come back from the dead, at least by natural causes. But this is supplied to Jesus. Uh, I think not, because the hypothesis from the very beginning isn't that Jesus was raised naturally from the dead or unassisted. The hypothesis from the very beginning was that God raised Jesus, or Jesus was assisted in coming back to life. And a hundred billion people dying and remaining dead and not coming back by natural causes or unassisted tells us absolutely nothing pertaining to whether Jesus could come back from the dead assisted or by supernatural causes. So I don't think the resurrection hypothesis is implausible. I don't know that I could say it's plausible. Now over the last few months, six months, I've come to believe that there is a degree of plausibility, but I don't have time to argue for that this evening. So I'm just going to be content this evening to say that the resurrection hypothesis is neither plausible nor implausible, it's just inscrutable. Because you have to know whether God, if he exists, would want to raise Jesus from the dead, and that's pretty difficult to be able to determine. What about ad hoc? I don't think the resurrection hypothesis is ad hoc. Um, that, at most you could say, well, it kind of supposes that God exists. No, I haven't really said that God raised Jesus, I've just said he was raised by uh, let's just say a supernatural cause, if you will. Um, and because we can't prove that it would have been God that raised him. I think God's the best candidate for it, of course. But as a historian, I can't show that God raised Jesus any more than as a historian, uh, I could show Jesus died by crucifixion, but I can't prove that his death atones for sins. 
So I don't think it's ad hoc. But even if you want to say God raised Jesus, there's still pretty good evidence from philosophy and science that God exists, I, I think. Explanatory scope and power. Uh, I think uh, the resurrection hypothesis adequately accounts for all the, the facts that we're talking about in CD. Without forcing them to fit or without excessive or any ambiguity. So it passes these. Bottom line, resurrection hypothesis passes three of the four hypothesis uh, criteria for the explanation, best explanation with flying colors and doesn't fail the fourth. So it does a pretty good job. What about the leading naturalistic hypothesis? There's a lot of them out there, but probably the one held by most would be hallucinations. Hallucinations comes in many different forms in terms of the hypotheses. Everybody has a different hypothesis. Let me just give you a generic one. That is, Jesus died. He died a sudden and violent death. His disciples went into despair. They were shocked. What are we going to do now? Uh, when people are grief stricken like this, they often turn to the bottle. You know, they could get drunk back then. Paul said, don't get drunk with wine. They had hallucinogenic drugs. You know, maybe there was another reason they called Jesus the Most High God. <laughs> you know, so he's, uh, they're distraught about this. They get high, drunk, something. They see a shadow. There he is! Oh, he's up there! You know, and they think they see Jesus risen from the dead. And, um, uh, you know, that's how the appearances. The problem with the hallucination hypothesis is, number one, it can't account for the group appearances. Because again, we got not one, two, but three group appearances in this earliest material that says that, you know, that he saw Jesus. Um, second, you got the, the problem with uh, the fact that hallucinations come in six different types of modes visual, auditory, uh, olfactory, gustatory, uh, tactile, where you feel something touching you, or, or kinesthetic, where you feel the sense of motion. Like when you're Having a dream that just before you wake up you feel like you're falling off something, that is called a kinesthetic hallucination. We've all had those. See, you don't have to be a flake to have a hallucination. <laughs> all right? The group most likely to experience a hallucination are senior adults or even the loss of a loved one. Multiple studies reveal approximately 7% of them experience visual hallucinations. That's the highest percentage. And yet when we come to Jesus' disciples, he appeared to the 12. He appeared to more than 500 one time. He appeared to all the apostles. At least in two of those cases, it's 100%, not 7%, but 100% experience a visual hallucination simultaneously, and the content must have been so similar that they all thought they were seeing the same thing. Doesn't sound like a hallucination. Hallucinations also don't account for the appearance of Paul. Jesus would have been the last person in the world he would have wanted to see. So it doesn't have good explanatory scope, it's implausible because it, it's not in agreement with what we know from modern psychology pertaining to hallucinations and group hallucinations. In order to account for some of these, you might have to say, well, weird things happen sometimes. This is one of the times that not one, two, but three weird things happen with the group appearances. That's forcing it to fit in Mike's explanatory power. Well, maybe Paul was feeling guilty for killing all those nice Christians, and he wanted to resolve that, so he had a conversion uh, disorder. Uh, and experience of hallucination is resolved. Of course, the problem with that is there's not a shred of evidence for it, and so it's ad hoc. So in order to compensate for its lack of uh, uh, explanatory scope and plausibility, you've got to sacrifice some other things. So that is the leading naturalistic hypothesis does a horrible job at, at fulfilling the criteria for the best explanation. Resurrection hypothesis does an outstanding job, three of the four, and doesn't fail the fourth. Therefore, just from a historian's viewpoint, we can see that the resurrection hypothesis is far superior to the hallucination hypothesis, the leading one. And when you do the same exercise using other hypotheses, you find out that the resurrection hypothesis comes out on top every time. It is by far the best historical explanation of the data. And that excites me as a Christian. And I think, just in concluding, we told, told about why this is important at the very beginning. But the practical implications for everyone is, if Jesus rose from the dead, it shows that Christianity is true. It tells us that God loves us, He cares for us, and if you're experiencing some difficulties in your life, a blown up marriage, um, you just found out you had cancer, you got financial problems, your house is ready to get repossessed, you just lost your job, whatever it is, if Jesus rose from the dead, it means you matter to God. Thank you.
Our second participant this evening is Dale B. Martin. Dale Martin is the Woolsey Professor of Religious Studies at Yale University. He was educated at Abilene Christian University, Princeton Theological Seminary, and Yale University. His work explores the New Testament, Christian origins, the Greco-Roman world, the ancient family, and gender and sexuality in the ancient world. Professor Martin has been awarded fellowships by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Fulbright Commission, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, he was elected to that position in 2009, and his publications are quite numerous. He's a prolific author. His publications include Slavery as Salvation, The Corinthian Body, Inventing Superstition, Sex and the Single Savior, and Pedagogy of the Bible. Numerous of these books are for sale on the book table on your way out after this evening. Professor Martin lives in New Haven, Connecticut, and we are very, very pleased to have him with us this evening. So, Professor Martin, let me ask you, did Jesus rise physically from the dead? Can you give Dr. Martin a warm nose for the dead? that nobody can see and 
I just I, I actually read up a lot on popular presentations of theoretical physics and cosmology, and the, the category of matter and the category of physical doesn't mean anything anymore. Second, I also don't believe that in using a category called the supernatural. I've written on this in my Corinthian body book and a bit more in my Inventing Superstition book. So I'm going through this stuff really pretty quickly. But I'm, this is, this, I have to say this stuff because there are certain words I just won't use because I don't believe they're helpful, either from a scientific point of view or from a theological point of view. Nobody in the ancient world, until maybe the Neoplatonism of the 4th and 5th century, had any kind of category of the supernatural in their heads. They believed, and Greeks and Romans believed this, and I think most early Christians and Jews believed it, that everything that exists, exists as part of nature, phusis. So, they just didn't have the category of the supernatural. There was no word for it. I found a word around 500 in Pseudo-Dionysius' theology. He uses the Greek word kuperphusis, which is the closest thing, but it's a new word in the, around the year 500. Before that time, I can find nobody in the ancient world who divides up the universe into the natural world and the supernatural world. I believe that division came about mainly from René Descartes and his philosophy. So I, it might have been earlier, but that's where I place the beginning of modernity, which separates out a realm of the supernatural, angels, demons, souls, spirits, these kinds of things, separate from a range of nature. And so I just don't use the term because it didn't exist in the ancient world. Paul or Jesus knew nothing about it. No early Christian writer until maybe the 5th century or 6th century knew anything about it. Also, I don't think it makes any sense in the modern world, or what in my world is the postmodern world. That clean separation of nature that we know everything about and operates by rules that we know everything about, I don't think that exists. And I think some modern science shows it doesn't exist. So I'm not going to use the word supernatural. What I believe, I also want to make a difference that what I mean when I say history. History is not the same thing for me as the past, nor is it the same thing as what happened. Since I don't know what it means to ask whether or not Jesus physically rose from the dead, I'm going to address the issue by saying, what about the earliest Christian claims about Jesus' resurrection can a historian defend as historical? What claims or stories rise to the level of history and how and why. History refers to what modern professional historians construct about what they think may have happened in the past. There's no way the past is successful. The past is gone. It doesn't, the past, it's shocking to say this, the past does not exist. So if I write a history about the Civil War, you can't take my book on the Civil War and hold it up next to the Civil War and see where I got it right. All you can do is take other people's historical constructions of the Civil War and say, does this, does Dale Martin play by the rules of modern historiography as well as or better than other modern historians? That's what historians actually do. They don't travel back in time to find the Civil War. They, they read historical accounts and judge which of them play by the rules of modern historiography. So the past is something that's happened, but the event of the past is not the same as the history of what happened. For example, no history of the Civil War could reenact the absolute whole Civil War, right? It's just it would be impossible. You'd have to take out the whole four years that the American Civil War happened. So the history of the Civil War is a story, a narrative about an event, not the event, nor is it even a reconstruction of the event. A reconstruction would be like if we could take the Titanic out of the ocean, the remains of it, haul it all land, and put it physically back together. That would be a reconstruction of the Titanic. Historians can do nothing like that when they write history. They are constructing history as accounts that they, about things they think of from the past. So what can we do with that about the stories of Jesus raising, rising from the dead? I believe we have basically five people we can go to for data about this. Paul, who is the only eyewitness, the only eyewitness we possess, I believe, is Paul, to any uh, resurrected body of Jesus. And then the four Gospels that are in our, our camp, Matthew, Mark, and John. What did Paul see? He claimed to have seen the resurrected Jesus. He is also the earliest account we have, by far, as Mike showed very well. But Paul claims that he saw the same thing that all the other people saw. He gives a list. And as Mike again said, Paul's claims in 1 Corinthians 15 depend on his insistence that what he experienced was not different in kind from what the twelve and the other apostles experienced. 
Paul's claims also depend on his insistence that the future resurrected bodies of Christians will be of the same kind as Jesus' resurrected body. And Paul's resurrected body, I believe, Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians 15, is not a flesh and blood body. It is a body in which the flesh and blood has been transformed into a purely pneumatic body. And this is the way I prefer to put it, rather than the strange translations you get in your English Bibles of 1 Corinthians 15. Pneuma, this Greek word that's often translated spirit, in the ancient world was considered a material stuff. It was invisible, perhaps, or it was what we see when we see light. We see fiery pneuma. It's, it's, not, it's not too different from the way ancient scientists talk about the ether, which is that very, very thin, kind of gaseous stuff, stuff that's the lightest and highest stuff in the cosmos. Pneuma was, Galen, the, the medical writer, said, pneuma is that stuff that exists in your head. You breathe it in the air. Your brain refines out everyday air and refines out the pneuma in that air. And that's a material stuff that exists in your body, and it runs through your body to tell your body how to move. This is pneuma running from my brain through my arm, telling my body to go up and down. When I touch something, that's pneuma, uh, a physical stuff racing back and forth through the, ne the nerves to get to my brain to tell me I touched something, or that it's too hot. Pneuma is the stuff that brings the whole cosmos together in stoic thought, for example. So the word we translate spiritual or spirit actually was in ancient science and medicine and philosophy, and I think in everyday thought, a physical material stuff, just very, 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 very rarefied stuff, like we might think of as oxygen, like we think of as oxygen. So what Paul is teaching in verse 15 is flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And I make a much more elaborate argument about this in a full chapter of my book, The Corinthian Body, where I show how this is a perfectly rational thing for Paul to believe in the first century. What Paul believed was that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So he says, what kind of body does, did Jesus have when he's resurrected and we will have? It's as different as a seed is from a flower. But it's, there's continuity, but there's also discontinuity. And I, believe, I said the discontinuity is the flesh and blood body, which had some pneuma in it, will be transformed at the end of time, just like Jesus' body at his death was transformed so that it no longer had flesh and blood. It was a, purely, it was a body made of pure pneuma, a pneumatic body. So it wasn't flesh and blood. The relationship to Jesus' pre-resurrection body to his post-resurrection body is like the relationship of a seed to a plant. They need not look anything alike. Does a flower look like a seed? No. Note that Paul gives no indication that he knew anything at all about an empty tomb. He claims to have seen the body of the resurrected Jesus, but it was not a flesh and blood body. It was a pneumatic body. A body composed of the stuff of pneuma. So, Paul's our only eyewitness to this body. And he describes it as a pneumatic body, whatever that would mean. It's hard to imagine what he's thinking of. He does believe it's physical in his sense of the word physical, because pneuma is a physical stuff in Paul's world. Now, arguments against the historicity of the empty tomb scenes, though, is what I'll be concentrating on for the next ten minutes, man. I believe that none of the empty tomb stories in the Gospels has any claim to historicity <coughs> at all. They differ about who saw something, what they saw, where they saw it, when they saw it, what Jesus looked like, that is, what was the very nature of his body. Was it flesh and blood or not? Mark, three women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, discover the empty tomb and see a young man in the tomb itself. They do not see Jesus. The young man tells them to tell the disciples and Peter to go to Galilee, and there they will see Jesus. But the text of Mark tells us that the women do not tell the disciples. No one sees the resurrected body of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. No one. Matthew seems to follow Mark, but with his own changes. In Matthew, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, note there's no mention in Matthew of Salome, because there wasn't Mark, Experience an earthquake. A descending angel rolls the stone, the stone away. Note that Jesus does not exit from the tomb. They don't see Jesus walk out, even though they supposedly see the stone roll away. Jesus' body, therefore, may not have been considered by Matthew a flesh and blood body, because just Jesus doesn't have to have the stone rolled away to exit the tomb in the Gospel of Matthew. He tells the women that Jesus has been raised and has gone to Galilee. On their way to the disciples, note that unlike in Mark, 
the women are said here to have some fear, but also joy. And Martha was just afraid. They are met and greeted by Jesus, two women. They worship him. He tells them to announce to the disciples his resurrection, and that the eleven, now, because Judas has killed himself, according to Matthew, the eleven disciples should meet him in Galilee. No one but the women see Jesus in Jerusalem on the third day. Two women, that's all. The eleven, and only the eleven, according to Matthew, we don't have any other mention of anybody else, they go to Galilee some days later. It would take at least four days probably to get from Jerusalem to Galilee. They see him on a mountain in Galilee, and Jesus gives them what's called the Great Commission. Notice there's no real ascension scene. We kind of imagine it often in Matthew, but you aren't, he just ends with the commission. Now, time and place go together. <clears throat> but we'll, we might not have time to talk about that during this first 25 minutes of mine. Luke. In the Gospel, which will be a little bit different from Acts, which was also written by the same author, the women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women, so there are several women, we just thought there's not a name, and they see two men, notice there are two men now, not one, in dazzling clothes. They see the empty temple, the tomb, but they do not see Jesus. They tell the eleven. Peter then inspects the empty tomb, but doesn't see Jesus. So, so far, no one's seen the body. Later that day, Jesus appears to Cleopas and another unnamed disciple at Emmaus, which is seven miles from Jerusalem, according to the NRSV choice of 60 stadia, rather than the 160 stadia in some other text. Perhaps later, they're the first people who are narrated to see Jesus' body after his death, according to Luke. They go back, maybe simultaneously, it is reported that Jesus appeared to Simon, which is probably Peter. Jesus then suddenly appears to them all, the eleven and their companions, it says. So we're not really sure exactly how many of them there are. Jesus so chose them his flesh and bones and wounds, and he eats fish in front of them and denies it as a ghost. So Luke's Jesus is an actual flesh and blood body. Jesus leads them to Bethany, suburb of Jerusalem, blesses them, and while blessing them, he ascends into heaven. So it sounds like this all happens in one week, basically, or, or even on the third day. But just in a few days, Jesus appears to them, to the eleven their companions, and then he ascends to heaven. In Acts, though, we get a different account. Jesus here is depicted as hanging around Jerusalem, appearing regularly to his disciples, and for a 40-day period of time. So it's specified that Jesus appears to his disciples for 40 days. He tells them to remain in Jerusalem until they are baptized with the Holy Spirit, which happens at Pentecost, 50 days later. He ascends to heaven outside Jerusalem from Mount Olivet, and then they see two men and return to Jerusalem. They do not leave Judea until much later in the narrative, and they are explicitly said to remain in Jerusalem until after Pentecost at the earliest. That's Acts. All the appearances to Jesus in Luke and Acts take place only in Jerusalem and its suburbs. All. They all appear only during a 40-day period of time and then stop. In John, Mary Magdalene is the first to go to the tomb. She sees the empty tomb, tells Peter and the beloved disciple, they return home without seeing Jesus. A bit later, Mary, still at the tomb, sees two angels at the head and foot of the slab, but she doesn't see Jesus in the tomb. Later, she thinks she's still, uh, oh, she's still at the tomb. No, she, thinks, she sees Jesus in John 20, 14, but thinks he's the gardener. Notice. Mary just saw him three days ago. She's standing right there with him, and she doesn't recognize him. Mary is told to announce the resurrection and the coming ascension to the disciples, which she does. That evening, so the evening of the first day, Jesus appears to the disciples in a locked room in Jerusalem. One week later, Jesus appears to them again, now including Thomas, doubting Thomas. Now, the last chapter of the Gospel of John, most scholars believe, is an epilogue tacked on sometime later by somebody else who, than the author of the other part of John. And it sounds like an epilogue, because it says this. After these things, in chapter 21, some of the disciples are in Galilee. Simon Peter, Thomas the twin, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. They go fishing. Jesus appears to them just after daybreak, and Jesus makes breakfast. 
And then the chronology says, this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the, te from the dead. So John gives us even a chronology of counting. Okay, what's, what do we conclude from these? The only two things all five accounts, the four Gospels of Paul, uh, have in common is, number one, that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead, and number two, that it was on the third day. Everything else, who's, who saw him, where they saw him, when they saw him, what else they saw, was a young man, an angel, two men in dads and clothes, two men sitting in a tomb, one of them had one foot, Mary sees, what Jesus looked like differs in all the different accounts. Paul's list, for example, says he appeared first, and this seems to be chronological, first to Cephas, that is to Peter, then the twelve, the disciples, that is, then more than 500 brothers at one time, then to James, which is Jesus' brother, and then all the apostles. Notice for Paul, the category of the apostles is not the same thing as the category of the twelve. And then to Paul. Obviously not part of the list of himself that he's inherited, but Paul inserts himself. The earliest, the earliest list, Paul's, doesn't mention Mary Magdalene at all. Matthew and John say that Mary was the first to see Jesus. Matthew has appearances over probably several days, but only to 13 people. Acts has Jesus appearing all around Jerusalem and in suburbs over a limited period, 40 day period. Paul has the appearances going on for a few years, and apparently several different locations. Acts insists that all appearances occur only within 40 days and only in the air of Jerusalem. Matthew insists that Jesus appeared to the 11 only in Galilee. Finally, what did Jesus look like? According to Paul, Jesus' pneumatic body could have looked no more like his flesh and blood body than a flower does to a seed. According to both Luke and John, his disciples tended not to recognize him when they first saw him, suggesting that we have here reflections of earlier traditions that Jesus' resurrected body didn't resemble his pre-resurrected body. The, people, the disciples on the road to Emmaus don't recognize him until he breaks the bread. Mary doesn't recognize him at the tomb. The disciples out in the Sea of Galilee don't recognize him at first. It's, it's when later they say, ah, he's making his bread. I think that's Jesus. So they, he didn't, they didn't recognize him when they first saw him. The gospel, no, I'm sorry, I skipped that to the Also, according to Luke and John, Jesus' body was flesh and blood. These are the kinds of inconsistencies that a story would expect when encountered stories that grew up and changed over time and space. You get the basic idea that Jesus was raised from the dead, right? You even get this very old tradition that was on the third day. But every other detail differs. If you put five people who all claim they saw a murder, and you put them in five different rooms, and the only thing all five of them can agree upon is that they saw it, but they can't agree on who did it, how many accomplices were there, how many people were there, was it in Houston or was it in Washington, was it over, did they take them 40 days afterwards to do it or did they do it on the third day? If you have all these disagreements among five witnesses, you wouldn't be able to accept the witness of any of them that they actually were, were there. So the only witness we have, the only one we have who claims to be an eyewitness to the resurrected body is of Jesus Paul, and he saw a pneumatic body, and it happened years, at least, at least two, maybe four years after the death of Jesus. All the other details just don't add up. One last piece of evidence, it seems to me, and I'm just trying to watch my time. The empty tomb, if the empty tomb stories were historically true, I, as a historian of religions, would have strongly expected that that tomb would have become a place of veneration among early Christians. If they knew where it was, why did they go back? It was very popular in the ancient world for people to have picnics in tomb, around tombs. The family and the loved ones would get together on the anniversary of a death, and they would actually celebrate the person's memory with a picnic. If they, believed, if they knew the tomb where Jesus had been raised from, why did it take over 200 years for Christians to start venerating the tomb? And then they had to pick one that doesn't seem to fit the archaeology of the, of the biblical narratives. It, it took basically Helen, the mother of Constantine, the emperor of Constantine, 
to go back, and, and she was hearing traditions about where the tomb might have been. But she said, okay, this is the tomb, build the Church of the Holy Sepulchre here. That's in the 4th century. If the tomb, if they knew where the tomb was, why didn't they use it as a place to pray? As a place to have an Easter worship service? There's no evidence that early Christians knew where the tomb was until too late to count as historical evidence. And I think I'll stop there for the moment. Yeah. I left you two more minutes. There's a lot of other stuff I could talk about, which is matters of historiography. Why is it that historians have come to believe that you can't bring God into history? You may believe that, this, that the North won the American Civil War because God did it. But if you try to get tenure with that as your thesis, <laughs> you will be denied tenure in any reputable American or Canadian university. It won't happen. That's not what historians do. The other things that I can talk about is history has to be symmetrical. So if you believe that, that God is the agent who caused the resurrection of Jesus, or that the resurrection of Jesus is an absolutely unique historical super, but supernatural event, You've got to be able to deal with the claims of other religions that are very similar and have similar supporting evidence. If you accept Paul as an eyewitness evidence that get, get, makes you think this rises to the level of history, you have to do the same for other stories that all the way through. And those of us who teach religious studies in a comparative way, we're used to being held to this standard. You cannot give a historical account of your own religion that you would not allow for other people of whose religion you are not adherent. And we can talk about that principle of symmetry during the discussion time. So what we're going to do now is actually my favorite part of the night. I thought those opening presentations were, were very good. But uh, we're going to move into a time of dialogue. So, each of these scholars are going to be able to sort of ask questions and critique each, one, each other's views on this evening's topic. And it's as though we get to, you know, be there as they talk to each other, which is exactly what we're doing. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with when, uh, when Dale is able to figure out that modern electronic device. You got it? Okay. So, so Dale's going to start asking Mike some questions, but we're going to go for about 25 minutes, and I'm just going to ask these guys to sort of, you know, share the time, go back and forth, talk about what you agree on, disagree on, ask each other questions, try to trip each other up, have fun, and um, do you have a phone call? Okay. So, uh, are you ready to go? Okay, so Dale, you can uh, get started. Well, Since you didn't talk about um, the empty tomb narratives, uh, I would like to know, uh, number one, how do you deal with those uh, or empty tomb periods as a historical event? And if you do, um, does it bother you the kinds of questions that I raise about inconsistencies in my opinion? And it seems to me that uh, what you would need to do is not only give an, uh, an account of what you think happened there, um, and either which account is best, or, or some amalgamation of them, or if you believe they can all be harmonized in some way, I, I just don't see it. But I, what I want, and then the other thing is that, see, I believe I can give a fairly historical, historical guesses of how, from the belief of some of his disciples that they saw him after his death, and I have no idea what they actually saw or what they experienced, but I don't deny that they believe, at least some of them really believe they saw Jesus after his death. From that core germ belief, which is one of the things you and I share completely, how do you get all these different empty tomb stories that don't match each other? Well, I'm, I'm really glad you, you asked that, to be honest with you, Dale, because this has, since uh, my first debate with Bart Ehrman uh, back in 2008, uh, he raised this, raises this, of course. And I don't know, the differences never really bothered me, but they do bother a lot of Christians. And so I really started to, to look into these differences. The first thing I did was I read the Gospels many times uh, in Greek because it really slowed me down, as, as you know, read it that way. Um, and, and helped you see things that you just don't see in English because we're so familiar with it. 
I began to see a whole lot more differences when I did that than I ever suspected were in there. And I, so I started to record them, and that grew, and that list grew, and now it's a Word document that's 50 pages long of differences I found between the Gospels. So then I put them in these categories of what I thought the evangelist meant Mark, Luke, and John were doing to account for the differences. But then that's only speculation on my part. Um, and some of the literary liberties I thought they were taking. And of course, as you know, there are historians who look at people like Tacitus, Suetonius, Plutarch, Leo Cassius, and they look at the same accounts to see how they told them differently, and then guess what their sources are to see what they did with those sources. But what I started to do, I thought, you know, there might even be a better way to go about this. And so I started reading Plutarch's lives, the 50 extended biographies that, that he wrote. And I found that of those uh, 50, nine of them involved figures that lived at the same time. People like Caesar, Pompey, uh, uh, Antony, Brutus, oh, you know, these guys. I, I looked and I found all the parallel pericope in there, and I found that there are 85 pericope stories that appear two or more times. There are nine that appear five or more times. So this provides a unique opportunity for us as historians where we can compare these parallel stories in Plutarch to see how he told the same story different times or in different ways, and what kind of liberties he took. And I read Theon, a, uh, a guy from the first century who taught how to write literature, and some of the techniques that he talks about, Lucian in the second century, and the only extant thing, uh, well, actually how to write history, it's called how to write history. And look these, and, and I applied them to Plutarch, and, and we see a minimum of six different liberties that Plutarch took. I'm still studying it, I, I think there's even several more but six that are in there. And when I go back to the Gospel account, say the resurrection errors and the empty tomb, and just in the Gospels, period, throughout, I find that the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially when we can look at what like John, what he does with the synoptics and Matthew and, and, Mark, and Luke, what they do with Mark, that they're doing the same kind of liberties that Theon said ancient historians, biographers should do, and that I can give multiple examples of Plutarch doing these. So Plutarch, the way he retells stories, he actually, there are greater differences in the way Plutarch tells stories, the same story, than the way the Gospel authors say Matthew and Luke retell the story from Mark. So what I see, all of these examples that you gave in your opening statement, I believe all of them, and I, I could show you examples in Plutarch where he takes the same kind of liberties, I believe that they can be explained, all of them, not by harmonization, I think you can harmonize some, but I don't want to do a uh, sub subjective text of hermeneutical waterboarding until it tells you what you want to hear. That's not what I'm into. But I am into seeing what the ancient historians, what liberties they took. And I think I see the Gospel of the the exact same liberties, and many times to a lesser extent than Plutarch does with the own, when he retells the same story. Does, does that make sense? I agree with you completely. I think that that's why uh, those of us who do a lot of comparison of New Testament materials with other Jewish and Greek and Roman uh, texts that are contemporary to them, we're not at all surprised when you find that the writer of Acts um, probably himself composed most of the speeches and sermons in Acts, because Thucydides is the beginning of his history of the Peloponnesian War tells us that's what he did. And we know from Plutarch and from other ancient historiog historiographers that his history, history writers were expected to make up from their own rhetorical training, not to reproduce the speech that Pericles said uh, on the funeral oration in Athens uh, in the 5th century. Uh, but he's, uh, Thucydides is supposed to tell you what he thinks Pericles should have said at such a funeral oration. And that's what we think, I think that's exactly what's going on in the Book of Acts, is you see the author constructing uh, things Except sometimes I think when he's, it shows he's using a source, a written source before him, uh, that because the speech doesn't fit his own theology. So I think the speech of Stephen is special in Acts because Stephen is actually giving an anti-mosaic, anti-law, anti-temple speech. And the writer of Luke and Acts is not anti-law, not anti-mosaic, and he's pro-temple. So I think therefore what you have is, in that case, uh, the author probably used some pre-source and stuck the speech of Stephen into that slot because he just thought it fit well there. But it doesn't match the <coughs> theology. 
But in most of the other places, the speeches that he gives, it doesn't matter whether Peter's giving it or Paul's giving it or whoever's giving it, they're remarkably similar. And it's precisely because they were written by the author himself. My question is just, though, that what that shows me is that these texts uh, are reliably um, uh, untrustworthy when it comes to providing historical data. See, I wouldn't go that far. Um, and the reason being is we can test how far they did go. And you're right, Thucydides talks about how to write speeches. Um, so does uh, Polybius a little bit later. So does Theon in the first century. And so does Lucian in the second century. And in no case do they say that you can invent a speech that did not occur. Um, in the case that you mentioned with Thucydides, what happens, yes, you can invent the speech that they would have given on that occasion, but it's not a fictitious occasion, it's an actual occasion. Yeah, that's right. And, and that's only the occasion, occasion they thought was actually. That there, that there were tons of stuff that we modern historians don't believe happened. So if they would have believed that this occasion would have, would have happened, and they would have reproduced the speech um, uh, according to what they thought they would have said on that occasion, if there were no eyewitnesses or anyone that could give them information. But if there was data on that speech, you couldn't just invent the speech out of whole bomb. Thucydides is clear on this, and so is Polybius, and so is Theon and, and Lucian, where you have to reconstruct the speech as carefully as you can after, if, if you're the eyewitness, you also get other eyewitnesses, and you reproduce it as best as you can. But then as Lucian says, the historian can take the data that he knows in reproducing those speeches, and then he can dress it up with his own oratorial skills and, and show off his own oratorial skills. So yeah, of course this isn't, there wasn't, you know, where you had uh, video cameras or digital recorders who were there to do, uh, to do this. Um, there was shorthand starting in Cicero's day, but we don't know that, you know, these shorthand recorders were around when the apostles were preached. But I, I would think, that when we look at the speeches in Acts, that these are fairly accurate recollections of what Peter or Paul or Stephen uttered on that day. And let me just say one other quick thing about this, especially when it comes to not only the apostolic curriculum and the speeches, but also Jesus' sermons. I, I do a lot of itinerant speaking. Um, I'm on the road a lot. So what is interesting is uh, if, if I give a lecture on the resurrection or the, the uh, historical reliability of the Gospels, whether I do it in, in Halifax or Fairfax, um, it, it's going to be a lot of the same thing. And, um, you know, Bart Ehrman, your, your colleague, uh, I mean, I consider to be a, a warm acquaintance of mine as well, although we're not you know, friends like you two are. But he gives the same speech all the time. I could almost quote him verbatim. And he will mix it up at times. But as he's talking, I could say, no. Yep, it depends which gospel you read. Uh, yeah, was it this? It depends which gospel you read. It does the same thing all the time. And so it's the same thing with Jesus. He's not preaching a new sermon every time he's out there. He's got maybe a dozen of them or something like that. The disciples are talking. And can you imagine? I mean, they've heard the parable of the prodigal son so many times. And I could just see Peter turning to um, uh, Thaddeus and saying, no, here he comes. Look at that business guy over here. Wait until they say the father gave him his inheritance. And he goes, oh, look at can't stand. You know, because it's the same thing each time. So I think that there's a greater uh, probability that when they were recording Jesus' sermons, that they're getting things extremely accurate because they heard it time and time and time again. What do you think about that? Well, I don't think I don't think any of our gospels uh, were written by people who were themselves eyewitnesses of, Je of Jesus' ministry. Um, I think they were all. Uh, Luke obviously points out that he's not, but. I think all of our Gospels were written uh, by people who were not disciples of Jesus during his lifetime. And I think in order to do so... Uh, but Luke said he got his information from the eyewitnesses, right? Yes, but this goes to the next question. I think you're completely exaggerating the value of eyewitness testimony. And I think this is even truer for the ancient world where people claim to be eyewitnesses and it's not reliable. But it's also being proved all over the place right now in court cases where the vast majority of people who have been cleared by DNA evidence that's now useful, they were convicted on eyewitness testimony. And in almost every case, eyewitness testimony was the strongest evidence they had. They didn't have the proper material evidence. And we've had you know, hundreds of cases overturned 
and proving that eyewitness testimony is not as reliable as a lot of modern people seem to think it was. And I don't think it was any more reliable in the ancient world. If anything, it was not as reliable in the ancient world as it might be in our world. And, and as far as I could bring two examples, um, uh, Nicholas of Damascus was a friend of Octavian. Uh, he was a friend of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was, was new Nicholas of Damascus in Rome. Uh, when he was under the secretary, was he? No. I think people might have said that. Uh, I don't think he was actually ever. They were, they were people of similar status. You wouldn't usually have a noble person as your boss. You know, low, you'd have a slave as your secretary. Um, Nicholas writes the life of Augustus. Um, and he knew Augustus. He knew Octavian for most of his life. And, and he tells, so he's claiming to have been an eyewitness of a lot of things that he tells in, that, in his life of Augustus. But I know no modern scholar of any type who will accept that a whole lot of what he tells us about Augustus is true. Because, you know, Augustus is a god for him. He's, he's trying to show that Augustus, you know, could have been made, his, Livia could have been made preg pregnant by a god, just like Alexander the Great was made pregnant by his mother. Not that Alexander was made pregnant, told me no. But his mother, uh, he claimed, even during his lifetime, was made pregnant by Zeus. So, you know, just because Nicholas says he's an eyewitness, and, we, and he was an eyewitness of much of Octavian's life, no modern historian believes a lot of what he says, both about Augustus' actions and about Augustus' miracles. Uh, Eusebius of Caesarea was a contemporary of Constantine, preached in his church a lot, was able to interview him. Constantine was a patron of Eusebius of Caesarea in the early 4th century. But no one would believe that Eusebius' life of Constantine even though Eusebius could be an eyewitness of it, we, don't, we just can't trust it as for historical data because of the nature of ancient historiography. Um, but that's where we come into applying certain criteria like multiple independent sources, uh, the criteria of similarity, unsympathetic sources, embarrassing sources. Right, and which is why I say that the, you know, I just don't think we can trust, I don't think you can call the Gospels anything like evidence for history in the way you can call, I think, Paul's letters evidence that I think that if the very least we can say is that Paul uh, believed he saw the resurrected body of Jesus after his death. And I think he sincerely believed it. And I think that some of the people he lists, although I certainly don't believe all the people he lists, also made claims to have seen the resurrected of Jesus. But I think that that's, that's as far as history can take it. I agree with you that if we had to cho choose between the Gospels and Paul, we give a, a little bit of an extra, we put a little more weight with Paul because he is earlier and we can really tie him to the Jerusalem Apostles with a, a little more strongly than we can the, the testimony of the Gospels. Um, and, but, but I don't think that these differences in the Gospels, if these guys are, are just writing according to um, the, the, they're exercising the liberties that they had available to them. We have to judge them not according to... I mean, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did not form a committee for the misleading of future historians. They used the literary liberties that were available to them in that day, and we have to judge them not according to 21st century literary standards, but 1st century. And when they're using these kinds of liberties that others use, then it, the end result is we might not know some of these peripheral details in which there are differences. Um, the position of the angels at the empty tomb or some of the order of events, certainly time compression, conflation, transferal, displacement, all these kinds of things are going to paraphrase. Um, so we might not know some of the peripheral details, but I don't think when we're looking at this ancient biography that that means that they're untrust historically untrustworthy. I think it's just they're they're still trustworthy. It doesn't, well, it doesn't, it doesn't disprove their trustworthiness. And then when we consider things like multiple independent sources, such as, you know, John is an independent source from the synoptics, and so you would at least have Mark, and you would have John, uh, with, with empty two narratives. You would have Paul, which he believes that Jesus' corpse was raised from the dead. And so I know you said physical, we don't know how to find it. So I'm just trying to say his corpse, and I think we get the idea even though it's transformed. So, if Paul believes Jesus' corpse is raised from the dead, that's certainly compatible with the two narratives. I don't see how it is. Paul, Paul's pneumatic body, Jesus, 
didn't need an empty tomb. Uh, a pneumatic body doesn't have to have a stone rolled away. A pneumatic body can pass through rock. And I think Paul, Paul just didn't even think about a tomb. I, I don't, I think Paul, I think it's just historiographically wrong to introduce even the possibility of the empty tomb as if Paul's thinking about it. There's no evidence that Paul had any notion of any empty tomb. And I think that's quite because the empty tomb narrative developed later. And Paul's writing only, say, 20 years after the death of Jesus, and Mark's written 40 years after the death of Jesus. Mark could have invented the account of the empty tomb. And he's precisely the one who has no one see Jesus at the empty tomb, or even afterwards. Um, Matthew could build up on what he's finding in Mark and say, well, if there was an empty tomb, we have to have some stories surrounding it. And then Luke also maybe he either uses Mark or maybe he uses Matthew and Mark, according to the other theory. And so Luke also said, well, we've got an empty tomb, we've got to have some stories about it. So Luke develops totally different stories than the ones we find in Matthew. Because the one thing they had in common is Mark, who has the empty tomb and no stories. And I think, although John, I don't think we can say that John had Matthew, Mark, and Luke in front of him, I think there's really good evidence that John knew the synoptic tradition. And I think it's really easy to read John as basically hanging Matthew over here and Luke over here and trying to make them both work. And so he comes up with his own stories, some new stories, but some of them take place in Jerusalem and some of them take place in Galilee. Because that writer now, writing maybe in the 90s, the end of the first century, uh, says, well, I've got a I'm going to make sense of all these different things because they don't agree with me. I would like to ask you another question, though, raised to the value of arguments. Can I, can sure. I just, I want to just follow up on one thing you said. You said um, Paul had no need for an empty tomb because was a pneumatic body. I'm curious to see what you, how you respond to something I said in my opening statement when I said that, you know, Paul believed in the resurrection of the corpse. When you look at 1 Thessalonians, which I, I'm sure you think is probably, just like I do, it's probably the earliest piece of literature in the New Testament. Yeah, I do. And in, in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verses 13 through 17, Paul talks about um, that the Christ is going to bring with him the, the, those who have died in him, and Christ, the, the dead. And then the dead are going to be raised first. Um, Paul also saw that when a person dies, they, they, they go immediately to be with Jesus in heaven. So just being with Jesus in heaven isn't resurrection. Something happens at the parousia of the second coming of Christ, which is called the resurrection. He brings the dead back with him, the spirits, or whatever you might want to call it, puts them back in the corpses, and then raises those corpses to transform them. So my point is that Paul envisioned the transformation of the corpse into whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to comment. I, I don't know. But it's uh, from Paul that it's. But he envisioned resurrection as involving the corpse, the corpse that is raised and then transformed. And so if the corpse is raised and it is transformed, well then that would involve an empty grave wherever that would be. I think you're putting two steps where Paul need not have thought of two steps. I think Paul thought that the resurrection is the same thing as the transformation. The resurrection of a dead body is the same process as the transformation of living body. And I think he said that would be in the twinkling of an eye. That all of a sudden, if you were standing there, your flesh and blood body, which also has a tomb in it, and Jesus comes back and at the word, whatever happened, then you would go poof. And the flesh and blood would be completely transformed into pneumatic substance. I think that's what he believed happened to Jesus' body. Uh, I think that's what he believed what happened to his body if he's still living. And I think that he believes that if the different parts of the body have been separated off by death, so that the, say that the soul or the spirit is in some other place, and the flesh and blood are in the earth, I think that what he must have imagined is that, that the, all the different parts of the body would all of a sudden be miraculously reunited and poofed. Is that part of the, So reunited, the, the body... In other words, I don't think you have to have a resurrection of a flesh and blood corpse first, and then the transformation of it into a resurrected body. Okay. I think the resurrection... Simultaneous. Yes. The resurrection is not possible... The resurrection, I believe, Paul believed, the resurrection of a flesh and blood body is not physically possible. The resurrection of a flesh and blood, okay, I would call that, if you want to say, I would say that there's part one and part two of the process, A, B. I don't know that it's necessary to, to find that, that, you know, we, we can move on from there. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that. But it does seem to me, whether it is a simultaneous thing, like as soon as the part of the person 
that goes, let's just, can I just call it spirit? Just yeah, to, sure. Okay. So the spirit, I don't think Paul is actually very consistent in the way he splits up the different person, okay. parts of the person. So just so, you know, we can talk consistently here. It's the spirit that Paul believes when a person dies, the spirit leaves the corpse, goes to be with Jesus in heaven. The resurrection would involve the spirit being reunited with the corpse, and then poof, let's say, okay? Um, it's transformed. So, what, what, even if it's in, in the pneumatic, or as you say in your book, like perhaps an electric bond or something like that, it's still something, it's a transformation, poof, that happens to this corpse. And so it's like 2nd Baruch uh, 49 through 51. Um, you know, 49, hour of the dead raised, 50. They're short chapters. <laughs> 50. Uh, well, the earth returns them to the same form in which it received them. 51. And then these are transformed into glorious bodies that shine like the stars. So it's still something that happens to the corpse. And so, I mean, Paul seems to think this corpse can do transform the corpse. It's swallowed up right by life. It, it can do some really cool stuff, although he doesn't go on to describe a bunch of these things. But it's still to the corpse. And if it happens to the corpse, it does leave behind an empty tomb or grave. Yeah, and Paul, I'm saying that Paul could easily uh, have imagined that Jesus' tomb, if Jesus had a tomb, so he, he never talks about a tomb. I don't personally believe we have any evidence that there ever was a tomb of Jesus. Um, I, I think it would be counterintuitive for the Romans to, um, I think, I don't go with Don and Hassan on, on a lot of things, but I think it would be odd for the Romans to allow the straggling followers or a guy who had just been crucified for imperial pretensions and to allow them to take his body and give him an honorable burial in, you know, a tomb. I just, the Romans didn't do that kind of stuff with people they crucified. Well, you so know, that's unlikely. Uh, like, for example, in Josephus, in Jewish Wars, Book 4, Section 317, he talks about just prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, there were some mercenaries that the Romans hired to come in and kill a bunch of Jews, and then it said that the Jews uh, were incensed because um, prior to this, it was the Roman custom to allow the Jews to remove the crucified and condemned from their crosses and give them a proper burial in Jerusalem. So this did happen in Jerusalem. Whether it was an honorable burial is something that could be disputed, but that the Romans allowed them to remove them from their crosses and to give them a proper burial Josephus himself testifies to it. And I don't believe everything Josephus says. <laughs> Josephus, Josephus is one man writing defensively about the Jews and himself. But then you got probably, probably in the 80s or 90s in, in Rome. And Josephus makes up stuff all the time. And if ever he can make up something to make the Jews look special, he will do it. So one example from one author does not a historical method make. You have to have general things. And I'm just saying, generally, most of us historians just believe that's not what the Romans typically did. Right, but they did in Jerusalem, according to Josephus. And Josephus has been shown to be accurate on a lot of things. Even the color of the paint in Herod's bedroom has been shown uh, that Josephus was accurate on that. Yes, I agree, he does invent, he embellishes, he does get some things wrong, but he gets a lot right. And so when you, you got Josephus saying it, and then you could say, hey, you got Mark. So they only have multiple attestations. <laughs> <laughs> we just uh, shoot through 30 minutes of dialogue right there? Yep. Okay, in under two minutes, do you have one last manual question for Dale? And then Dale, in one minute, I'm just joking. You have one minute to ask a question, and you have one minute to ask him a question. I can do it. One last nagging question. So I'm like, Oh, thanks. I have the first time. Huh? <laughs> um, I'm looking for the, the probably the most uh, significant thing. Um, okay, well, let me just say this. Uh, you said history, it's what historians can reconstruct about the past, it's not the past. I, I think you and I are in agreement there. Um, what we have about the past, I, I would say, and I'm curious what you'd say, think about this. What we have, like with the historical Jesus, is a reconstruction of what the, the real Jesus who walked the shores of Galilee would have been like. The real Jesus, of course, would have been more than we can reconstruct, but he's not less. It's kind of like a gravestone. The gravestone has a bit of information that we can know about the person, their name, date of birth, and date of death. The person in the grave is a whole lot more than the gravestone, but it's not, he or she is not less. And the historical Jesus, I think it's a, it's a reconstruction of basic things we can 
know about it. I would agree, it's not comprehensive, it's not absolute. In history, we talk about probability because we can't get into a time machine and return to the past and verify our conclusions. But neither can archaeologists, geologists, or evolutionary biologists. We apply the historical method, we talk about probabilities, and it's not perfect in either scientific method, but we find that it's on a regular basis, it's generally reliable, and far more reliable than other methods, such as tarot cards and magic eight balls. Would you agree with what I just said? I, I just wouldn't put any of it like that. How would you put it? Uh, historians learn certain practices when they're getting their PhDs. They learn that certain actions are outlawed and other actions are typical for the doing of history. They learn certain, certain tools, certain sources are better than other sources. And then they enact this practice over their career, trying to live by the rules of historiography the best they can. What they produce is not a reconstruction of the past, it is a construction of the past. And what, what the test of whether it's good or not, better than tarot cards or anything else, is not does it correspond to what happened. It's did it play by the rules of modern historiography in professionally accepted ways. That's what. That's the only thing it can do. You can't talk about it measuring the past because we don't have access to the past. One historian's book is considered better or worse simply by other historians. Notice this is all peer-reviewed kind of stuff. Just like the only people who really judge whether a scientific fact is a scientific fact are other scientists, not journalists. And it's the same way. So the best account of Socrates or Plato or Jesus will be what other historians believe plays by the rules of modern historiography the best. I'd like to, I mean, I'd like to respond, but I, I know I, we don't have the time. I know we don't have the time, so I'll respect it. My question is, um, when you put so much weight on eyewitnesses, I think this is highly problematic, and I want to use it as an illustration to see what do you think is going on here. I, I trust that you probably don't believe that Joseph Smith actually found, miraculously, gold tablets from which he translated the Book of Mormon. But we have actually much better eyewitness testimony for those gold tablets than we do for anything related to Jesus at all. Three men claimed that they saw, well, two of them together with Joseph, and one a few days later because he couldn't see it the first time. Out in the woods, the angel appeared to Joseph and them at the same time, holding golden tablets, there was the heavenly sword, the heavenly shield, on a rock. A few days later than that, eight, uh, eight men, four from Joseph's family and four from a very close family, said that they walked out of the Smith's home and out into the forest and over the woods, and they all came upon Joseph Smith sitting there with the gold tablets. He showed them to them, they touched them, they held them, they handled them, they saw that the writing, it was writing on them that they couldn't read. We have 11 eyewitnesses to the gold plates. They all signed a sworn affidavit saying they did this at the same time. And that this happened in July of 1829, and it was published less, only six months later, in March of 1830, when the Book of the Mormon was published. Six months later from the event, 11 eyewitness sworn testimonies in writing from the 19th century rather than from the 1st century. That seems to me by your standards to mean we as historians would have to say that the golden plates are a historical fact. And I don't know any historian except a Mormon historian, and even a lot of them would say it's a historical fact, who would say they can affirm that it's history. And I know not one, and I've done some research on this, I know not one non-Mormon historian believes any of that is historical, not one. I say this to say the practicing of history has to be done symmetrically. So what would you do with that That Well, first, the, the story that you mentioned about the eight of them being taken out back and actually get to touch and hold the place. I, I've studied Mormonism some. I've never heard that story. Um, well, story I'm taking it from the, there's a, the um, Richard Lyman Bushman biography, Joseph Smith, Rustone, Rowland, 2005. And I checked it with John Turner, who also has just published a book on Brigham Young, who's an expert on Mormonism. Um, well, I haven't heard that story. The story I heard about how they saw it was Smith brought them into a building because they had been asking to see these plates, and it's like he wasn't shown and said, look, we want to see these. 
So he brings him in and he has one of these hats, you know, top hats like Lincoln would have worn, you know, one of these things. He says, all right, I want you to come up one at a time and look down on the hat. That, that's a different story. That's, he did that with William Harris and another couple of guys, Crowley, too. But that happened earlier before this revolution happened. From what I understand, there were like eight of them uh, there. And when they didn't see it, and they all said they didn't see it at the end, he said, oh, ye of little faith, try again. They come up and apart. They saw it at that time. So it, I think it's also um, telling that of those 11 witnesses, Shortly after Smith died, eight of them left the Mormon church, and only three of them, only three of them, uh, remained, and they were all related to Smith. They had the last... No, but I, I've, been, I've read that even the ones who left, never in their whole lives, denied it happened. Oh, well, I, there could be some pride there, too. I mean, why would you leave the Mormon church if you thought it was true? The, the disciples, on the other hand were all willing to suffer continuously and all willing to die. I think history can show that Peter and Paul did and James the, the brother of Jesus. And Joseph Smith did. And he many more willingly. If you read the history of the church published by the Mormon church, he was, even though the church is against wine, uh, on the night of his death, he asked the sheriff to go out and they said, hey, you know, you want any meals? He said, yeah, pick up some wine for us. And the history of the church, again, this is Mormon literature, official Mormon literature, said that he was shooting down the steps at people while they were shooting back up at him. That's far from being the lamb who allows himself to be sheared. So this is the problem when you when you you don't submit the early literature of Christianity to the same kind of critical scrutiny that you're willing to submit Mormon literature to. Well, why would you say I'm not? No, I, I am. Because you're not. You're you're allowing. When you talk about all this list that Paul gives, you talk about these people as if this really does represent witnesses. We don't know that. All we have is a list from Paul. Would you agree Peter is accurately represented on that yes, list? Yes, but we don't change. have Peter's eyewitness testimony. All we have is hearsay. And I believe Peter may have been one of them. I believe Mary Magdalene may have been one of them. But she doesn't even make Paul's list. Well, because she's a woman, right? Well, we don't know that. That's well, another thing. It's another thing that conservatives keep throwing up. Right. It's, it's all special. Well, hold on. Let me clarify that. In the first century, a woman's testimony was not regarded with, with much weight. And so Paul, in verses 11, 12, and 14, refers to this oral tradition as kerygma. That's what he calls it. In other words, it's official formal proclamation. I'm not being bigoted in saying that. But what I'm saying is that Paul, or the apostles who formed this kerygma, we brushed the women out because we wouldn't have given them any mileage. That's why at least they weren't in there. But if Paul meets with Peter on two occasions, according to Galatians 1 and 2, then, you know, he's getting information from Peter to his side. And this is, you know, this is, he says, whether I or they, this is what we preach and what you believe. So it seems like he is getting this information from the Jerusalem apostles in terms of Peter, James, the Twelve. I just think that's evidence that you are willing to give yeah, Christian right. sources a lot more credence than you're willing to give non Christian sources. Well, you can agree to disagree. Uh, so, because of time constraints, we're going to go for about 10 minutes. Is that okay? 10 minutes of uh, QA from the audience. So, those of you texting your questions, uh, maybe a few of you guys are going to win the raffle and get your question asked. So, uh, the first question, maybe we'll, let, maybe we'll get two questions for each presenter. So uh, actually, here's a question for both of you. You can share this one and try to make your answers concise because we like to move quickly. Uh, so we all doubt our belief systems at times. What is the one argument against your belief about Jesus' resurrection that wakes you up in the middle of the night and causes you to raid the fridge while toting? <laughs> okay, Dale, you go first. I'm I, I, sure. I just don't. I don't doubt. Um, and it's because my faith is not based on historiography. I believe my faith is a miracle. And I believe I, I believe I believe because I wake up and I still believe. And I I go to church and continue to find my liturgy meaningful and my prayers meaningful and my community meaningful. And I believe that abiding faith is just a gift from God and I just take it as grace. And I really don't I I don't think it I don't bother with doubting the resurrection. I wish I could stay, say the same. I, I wish I had that kind of personality. I, I don't, um, and I doubt perpetually. And I have come to understand it's just the way I'm wired. It's the way I'm wired emotionally. Um, 
and I began to recognize that. I figured when I finished my 700-page book, I'd never have doubts again. But shortly after that, I found myself doubting, and I said, why am I doing this? And it's because it became a habit, and you just don't turn it off when you put the period at the end of your investigation. Um, the thing that keeps me up at, at night sometimes, um, and it doesn't happen nearly as often as it used to, would be, what if I'm wrong? I still ask that question, what if I'm wrong? What if I, I've done my investigation with at least the greatest amount of objective integrity that I could muster. I'm not saying that's completely unbiased, nobody can be. But I tried, I really tried, and I have a very clear conscience on that. But it's like, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm missing something? And, and that, that's the thing that causes me to rave for free at night. That's a great question. Fair so, way. one more question for each of you. This one is for Mike. When Jesus cries out, and the scriptures say that, I think you've heard this one before, uh, say that the tombs were open and the bodies of saints who had fallen asleep were raised, how can Jesus be the first fruits when he had not yet been raised? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's asked a lot, and I got in trouble last year for my, uh, uh, the, my proposed solution uh, with, with some of, of those on the far right. Um, I think, as I read through the Greco-Roman and Jewish literature, I see a lot of the same kind of stuff happening at the death of Julius Caesar, where pale phantoms were seen walking around at dusk, Mount Etna erupted, um, there were fightings in the heavens, a stream stopped flowing, black intestines were found outside of cattle. You find a similar kind of thing when Julius Caesar invaded Egypt, as reported by Dio Cassius. When Claudius Caesar died, uh, Dio reports this. Tacitus and Josephus report various portents, interesting things that happened prior to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus says a cow gave birth to a lamb. Um, I mean, you see these kinds of things, and I think that this is kind of, it's hard to, to I call it poetic or apocalyptic language. I don't know what you label it, but I, I don't know that these things were intended, these kind of things, because we see it a, a lot in the literature that surround things like the death of Caesars and great kings. Um, it's kind of, in my opinion, I think it could very well be, though I'm not certain, I think it could be some kind of special effects meant to emphasize the death of the king. So I don't know, and I, I'm just saying, I don't know um, if Matthew intended for us to interpret those raised saints in a literal sense. If he did, um, you do have the problem that you mentioned. Christ is the first fruits, what about them? Um, the only way you could get around that, if you hold that these were literally raised from the dead, would be to say they were raised in a body like Lazarus. But that means they're going to die again. That means they need food, they need shelter, they need clothes. And I'll bet they have some really cool stories to talk about of what happened in the past. But we don't hear anything about like that from the early church fathers. So I do have my question about it. There is one interesting thing, and that is when Kim Jong-il died in December of last year, similar phenomena were reported coming out of North Korea. A crane, a bird, was seen bowing in sorrow at the statue of Kim Jong-il's father. The uh, mountain on which Kim Jong-il was said to be born, there's a lake at the foot of that, and, and there was very thick ice because it was winter, and it said the ice cracked and it was heard from miles away, and there was some glowing uh, uh, letters and, and on the um, mountain that said something about Kim Jong-il, something about being divine, or something like that, and then it vanished at sunset. So are we really, did the North Korean government mean for this to be interpreted literally? I don't know. It's just kind of hard to understand. But we see these things even happening today in some cultures like that. So I don't know how to really interpret it, but I suspect that what we may be seeing here is some special effects that's common in the literature. Next, Mike. Okay, the final question is for Dale. According to the Gospels, Jesus healed the sick and raised people from the dead. Do you think these resuscitations influence how the disciples interpreted the Easter event? Yeah. Um, I think they definitely affected the interpretation. Um, I find it difficult to uh, explain the rise of the interpretations about Jesus' resurrection without presupposing some kind of uh, belief arising in some way uh, from some of his disciples that they saw him after he 
I don't think you can say when it happened or where it happened. I think it probably happened over a few years in several different places. And I think what happens is you, you basically then have to say, wait a minute, if he really is the Messiah, then what kind of Messiah is he? Because um, <coughs> Messiahs weren't expected to die. So you've already been shocked by the fact that he's crucified and no, no army came from heaven to save him and overthrow the Roman Empire. And I think what you have to do is you start looking for other kinds of ways to interpret Messiahship. And although Messiah had never been a crucified Jew in Jewish literature at the time, there were ideas that Messiahs could be uh, very powerful heavenly figures, maybe even divine like figures themselves. And so I think what they did is they went through the scripture and they started trying to come up with, uh, if we believe we, see, we saw him after he was killed, and we believe that he was a Messiah of some weird kind of type, how do we put that all together? And then I think they come in with pretty early with Paul is that, oh, he, this is the beginning of the end. This is, first, it's God's confirmation that he really is the Messiah, even though he didn't look like a Messiah. And then uh, it means he's going to be a different kind of Messiah, but it also means the resurrection of Jesus means the resurrection of everybody is very soon. And I think that what actually happened is that um, there were enough stories of healings and resurrections uh, from enough different cultural sources in the ancient world that they didn't have to go very far to interpret these as having special significance for Jesus. Thank you very much. Um, so, sorry, we have time to do that? Okay, well, I guess there's time for more questions. Bonus. Okay, Mike. In all four Gospels, the disciples did not even recognize Jesus. How do we know the man they saw was not a convincing imposter. Well, um, the Matthew 28, 17, um, I think is a very interesting one where it says, uh, they went to Galilee and saw Jesus there and some worshiped him, but others doubted. Um, the word that is used there by Matthew is this tazo, which means to think two things. The only other occasion is in Matthew, I think it's 16 around there, where Jesus is walking on water and he invites Peter to come out. Peter goes out and he's walking on water, and then it says, then he's, he doubted, or, or he started to see the waves, and he sunk, and Jesus grabs him, and he says, why did you doubt this pod zone? But it's important to see that in Peter's doubting, he was thinking two things. He was out on the water because he trusted, but then he was thinking, well, wait, how can this be? How can I be walking on water? And so he's doubting. This is great, but I'm walking on water. How can, how can this? So it's, it, so I think you, you can see Jesus' disciples, and it's like, um, wait a minute, we just saw him die. How can this be? So they've got some are just immediately worshiping and others are going, what? How can this be? Luke tells a similar thing in Luke 24 when he says Jesus appeared to them in the room and it said, out of joy and amazement, they were of unbelief. Apostats. An even stronger word than distanza. Now how can you have joy and amazement and unbelief? Well, it seems to me that Luke is using this the same way we would on a walk-off home run in the bottom of the ninth. Unbelievable! Um, I, I think it's that way. I mean, here these guys, they see Jesus crucified. The world is turned upside down. And then all of a sudden, I mean, it's the worst thing that could happen. And then shortly thereafter, the very best thing could happen. And eyes filled with tears, jaw dropped. It's like... How can this be? Out of joy and amazement, it was like unbelief. So I don't think that he was unrecognizable. Now in Luke, at the Emmaus disciples, when he appears to them, it says he kept their, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So that's the only occasion in which that really occurs. The only other occurrence would be Mary didn't recognize him, and, and there's just not enough detail to know what's going on in the text. She'd just been talking to the angel, or she thinks is a gardener, the body's gone, who knows, her eyes could have been filled with tears and not seeing, he could have been wearing a hoodie or something like this, and it right. could have still been somewhat dark. It, there's just not enough information in John to be clear, but Luke, their eyes were kept from hearing, and then Matthew and Luke have those as Todd's, so I, I don't think that's the case, and Mark doesn't give us resurrection appearances, so um, you can't say that he, it wasn't recognized by Jesus. Okay, so is this the real last question? This is the real last question now. 
Do you think the belief of the disciples that Jesus was raised from the dead was only imagined, or did it happen in a way that anyone could have seen the resurrected Jesus had they been there, assuming they were not blind? Well, this is like the if a film project, if a film camera did recording it. I'm not sure I understand exactly the question. Would would anybody have seen him alive, or would only certain pe certain people have sort of taken out of it? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> When I believe that what makes me a historian is that there are just certain things that I'm willing to say rise to the level of history. One of those things is Jesus was raised from the dead. The other is God did it. That's why I, don't, I have no idea what these people either saw. I sometimes imagine that it was kind of like the end of... Uh, uh, Jesus of, of Montreal, where, you know, they see a shadowy figure and they say, I've seen him as the Lord, because of course they wanted to, they loved him. I sometimes imagine that's what happened. Sometimes I imagine that people, some people had some kind of actual visionary experience. I'm enough of a religious study scholar from a comparative point of view to say, I don't feel any need to doubt the reality of, of religious visions on the part of some people. That's all I can say as a historian. What makes me a Christian, I believe, is the one thing I'm going to say is whatever they think they saw, God did it. Even if they saw a light and believed it was the resurrected Jesus, God caused them to believe that. Now, I can't say that as a historian, but I think that's the difference between me and a non-Christian historian who won't say that much. What I will say is I don't know what happened, and I don't really care what happened. The one thing I care about is, by faith, I believe that whatever these people experience, I will, I'm willing to say that God is the agent. Okay, so before we uh, give an applause, I want to say that these two gentlemen are going to be at the book tables in the back, and a number of their books are for sale if you want to keep learning both of our other ideas. And next year's Religion Soup, uh, there's some irons in the fire, we're still working on some ideas. First people go through the wonderful email system. So folks, let's give a round of applause.